Well, good morning, Cut Bank. Good morning, Moore. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, so, just as a as a recap, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into the into the slides. Kind of let them let them speak for themselves. So, just take a take a moment, relax, and and read through this slide if if you would. Anybody know who said that? I think his name's going to pop up here in a second. There it is. Uh, who's, who's heard of Richard Feynman? Anybody out there in the war or cut bank? Uh, anyway, Richard Feynman is one of my scientific heroes. So if you haven't, haven't read any of his work, uh, please do. He's got uh, not only some great physics that he's brought to the world, but also some fantastic personal memoirs. In fact, just this morning, my, my daughter, who's here at Hellgate High, had to report on a memoir of somebody famous. Richard Feynman is, is someone who's, who's done that. And so if you get a chance, go out and read some Richard Feynman, not only his physics, but also some of his stories, showing the creativity that, that can be applied uh, to science. And here's one more for you as well. Okay, and this is another uh, this is another famous scientist. Richard Feynman was a Nobel laureate, and so is Kerry Mollis. And one thing I really like about Kerry Mollis is that he has focused on solving problems that are tangible to, to most people. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of scientists try to go out there and solve these giant problems and, and get buried deep in things that don't really matter to humanity. But uh, Kerry Mollis is someone who came in with a really neat, neat technology in terms of DNA fingerprinting, something that uh, is valuable to a lot of different disciplines. So my, my point here is that uh, use your creativity, like Richard Feynman just taught us, and try to solve problems that are immediate and tangible and things that are going to have immediate effects on your own lives. That's, that's Kerry Mullis's um, message. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Uncle Helios, and we're going to try to figure out exactly who he is throughout the, uh, the course of the lecture. I was trying to come up with a creative name for this lecture, and it was really Allison who, who <laughs> threw, it, threw in uh, Helios. So uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean when we, when we get into the rest of the lecture, but this, this title, this lecture is entitled Uncle Helios, and I think what it's going to do for us is tie together that concept of human power that we've spent the uh, last couple weeks talking about, as well as solar power, the concept that we introduced last week. So Uncle Helios ties those two together. And also, next week on our panel, Allison said we're going to talk about money and finance and how that's related to energy. And this is the perfect lead-in to that lesson that we're going to do next week. So let's see what Uncle Helios has to teach us today. Oh, and happy Earth Day, by the way. It's April 22nd. Okay, so just a quick recap. I'm going to go through... Uh, human power, again, just so that's fresh in your mind, and, and so you can think about that quantitatively in the same way that Lord Kelvin <laughs> talked about uh, during week one. So you can think about the numbers, not just the concepts. We'll do the same thing with solar, those will be, and those will be tied together later in the lecture. So uh, a few other big things I'm going to throw out there is the trajectory of human energy consumption. How energy not only flows through our bodies, but flows through our technologies. And then I'm going to look at per capita energy, and we've done a little bit of that already. And then I'll finally I'll get into the, the Uncle Helio's problem statement, and then see how we're going to move forward into the future with the knowledge that we have right now, based on Kerry Mullis' suggestions. Okay, who remembers where this is? Where? Where is this on the planet? Okay, cut bank. Where where is this? 
Eastern Island. Easter Island. East, Easter Island. Great. And then, uh, what are the what are these statues for? More? Do you do you know what the statues are for? We we talked about this a little bit with uh, Jared Diamond's work. He studied that. Yeah, so we have a hand up and more. Okay, and more. What what were these statues for? They're on Easter Island. Yeah. Any idea what they're doing there? Protecting. Okay. Uh, so protecting from what? Evil. Okay. So so it was uh, maybe an ancient. Evil. I don't I don't know the answer to this one. I was just throwing it out there. But but uh, presumably, if somebody went to the trouble of of building these these statues, they must have had some type of purpose, either practical or perhaps impractical, if, if they were believing that they were going to protect from outside evil forces, maybe not the most practical use of resources. I also uh, threw the horses in here, because we talked about human power and horse power, it just happened like, whoa, there's horses actually walking around on Easter Island. <laughs> okay, and then uh, this one too, I just, just came across this on, on the web, but there you go, the, the question was, how did these statues get to where they were without cranes and machines and heavy equipment? Well, there were hypotheses posed about, well, really all these folks had was their own human power. So there were uh, some people not too long ago did some experiments to say, could just humans with our little 100 watts, our little 10 megajoules per day, actually do this? And uh, I don't know exactly how the experiment went, but here you can see uh, somebody actually trying to recreate what must have happened in the past that we don't have any real written records for. So another example of human power on Easter Island. So when you get a chance, go and read some of the work by Jared, Jared Diamond, a uh, really, really great thinker. And like I said, I had the chance to interact with him as a pen pal not too long ago. So neat, neat guy to get to know. So there's your human power recap. Okay, so what is this? Uh, Cut bank. Give me a give me an answer as to what what we're looking at here. Big solar panel. More. Do you think this is a, a real picture of a real solar installation, or maybe something that an, an artist drew? Yeah, I think it's something that an artist drew or created, probably. I, I, I think you're right. That was my guess. And to be honest, I don't know. The, the reason I think that is I don't see any cities around here. I don't, I don't see a, a town that's actually electrically connected to this. But I think what the, what the artist is trying to show is that if we're going to get our energy from re renewable sources, and remember solar energy is one, we're going to have to put a lot of, of solar panels out on the planet. Now, in a, in a place like this, um, is is that, a, is that a good thing or a bad thing to put a bunch of solar panels out um, in the desert? Give me a, give me a hand if, if you think that's a good and an okay thing, putting the solar panels in the desert. And, and who thinks it's maybe not the best idea to put the solar panels in the desert? Okay, so let's hear both sides. More, why is that a good idea? Put solar panels out in the desert. Nobody's been building in the desert, so it makes sense to put the solar panels there where there's no, where there, there's nothing built and where the most sunlight can be absorbed. Yeah, it makes sense. There's really nothing in the way. Uh, there's not really any vegetation that you're messing with. It's not valuable for, for cropland. Uh, cut bank, why might that be a bad idea to put the solar panels out in the desert? There's going to be good and bad in, in both. Why, why, why is that a bad idea? We raised our hand for it being a good thing. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, then more. Somebody at more, I think, had a had a said that's maybe not the best idea. And there are some reasons, perhaps. Um, well, there's nothing there for it to power. The electricity would have to go a long ways to power anything at all. Right. Yeah. And that, that's a great answer. And you have to build some kind of infrastructure. So you've added some cost. So there's always that balance between having something that has minimal impact yet a lot of good utility. So, great. Good Brad, I have answer. a question for sure, you. Sure. I've heard um, in the past that if we, and I, and I, I'm hoping you'll help 
remind me which state sure. it is, but if we were to cover the size of a certain state, we'd be able to power all of the United States with solar panels. That's a great question. Alan. Tell me more about <laughs> that's this. A, that's a great question. <laughs> so, and we'll definitely follow up this with the larger the lecture, but when you sit down and pencil it out, and we're, and we're actually going to do a little bit of calculation today, when you sit down and pencil it out, you need to cover uh, a state about the size of, of Texas. That's if, right. If we, mm -hmm. if we covered Texas with solar panels, we could power the planet. Again, you need a lot of long extension cords, right? Because most of the planet's not that close to Texas. But as it, as it turns out, uh, something this size would, would have to grow to the size of Texas in order to actually supply all of our energy needs. Great question. Thanks, Allison. OK, so that's our human power review. And that is our solar power review. So let's get into the uh, Uncle Helios lecture. And I'm just going to throw a few numbers at you that I'd like you to write down. And I know we've done this is somewhat review, but here's 10 megajoules per day. And I think everybody remembers that 10 megajoules per day was the same as that 2,500 calories that you need to eat metabolically. Um, 200 megajoules per day, I hope you remember, is the average amount of technological energy that each person uses. So, so technologically, the average person on Earth uses about 20 times the energy technologically that they do metabolically. And mm -hmm. even giving this lecture right now, I've got lights on, I've got the computer, um, we're consuming technological energy at a rate greater than we can mechanically, than we can metabolically. And you asked them last week to sort of see if they could keep a journal of how how much energy they were using. And I'm right. curious if anybody did that or came up with a number that was close to this. Oh, yeah, thanks for the reminder. Did anybody actually come up with a number in terms of megajoules, of how many megajoules you used in a day or in a week? It's a tough, it's a really tough question. I, 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 I threw it out there for the truly motivated student, but it, it, it's a really tough question. Any, anybody work on it at all? Show hands. Oh, Cut bank, all Cut, right. Oh, Cut bank, did you come up with some, no and, and somebody from more as well. Cut bank, did you come up with any numbers? We each did our own thing for like different portions of the like things we use in the day, but we didn't add okay. them up. Like we did gasoline, calories, home energy, yep. one other okay. person did calories. Someone did energy at school, someone did wood burning for their house, and someone did natural gas. Oh, that great. Year. Well, you know what I'd love to see is maybe some emails from you, because uh, this, is, this is one of the assignments that we actually do in our college level courses. And, and we do that uh, really for bigger reasons, because these things cost money. We're going to see that next week. And it becomes not only an energy budget, but a financial budget as well. So great, great job working on that. So I want to just say, cut bank yeah. really quickly. Cut bank. Well, if you have your teacher email those numbers to me, um, or if you want to add them together to come up with a full, a full list, we'll present that at the beginning yeah. next week of yeah. the panel next week. That'd be some great feedback. Yeah. Thanks for following through on that. Yeah. Guys. Okay. And, then, more. and also more. What was your, uh, what was your method for measuring energy? Um, we were a little bit confused on the question and tried to figure okay. out how many calories a day we were eating and then how okay. much energy a day we would use. Okay. Well, send me, send me what you came up with. And here's, here's the distinction, because that's a great question. This, this top number right here, 10 megajoules, should be about the number of calories, well, if you do the conversion, of energy that you use to power your own body, the, the energy that flows through your body. This one, the 200 megajoules, is the energy that flows through your machines. So Cut Bank mentioned gasoline, mentioned wood burning stoves. Uh, you could do your home electric, your home gas. That's what this bottom number should be adding up to about. And that's the average person on planet Earth. Now the next number, uh, 1,200 megajoules per day. So we know that uh, not everybody is, is average, right? Some people are above average, some people are below average on, on a variety of scales. But 1,200 megajoules per day is the average North American's technological diet. Wow. Well, and there's, there's reasons for that, right? So we live far from the equator. We need to keep ourselves warm. Uh, frequently, we, we don't live near where we work. We need to drive back and forth. We want to go on vacation. We need to fly airplanes. So this, this, this is the North American's daily technological energy budget, about six times the average. Okay, and then the next one, 
500. Um, who knows what the E in EJ means? I don't think we covered. We might have covered it briefly, but um, raise it, your hand if you have it. If you yeah, let me know if, you, if anybody knows what the E. Everyone knows that the J means joules. That, that's pretty clear. Uh, the the big M means mega. We've, we've covered that. But how about the E? Not something you, you're probably used to using. Exa. I heard exa. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how big is an exa? So uh, big M is is a million. Uh, how how many, and has six zeros behind it? How about the the big E for exa? That's a tougher one, and it's not something used in everyday language. As it turns out, the exa is 10 to the 21st. So uh, m for mega is, is 10 to the 6th, and then we go to giga, 10 to the 9th, tetra, 10 to the 12th, peta, 10 to the 15th, and now we're up at uh, exa, 10 to the, oh, sorry, I think I said 10 to the 21st, 10 to the 18th, got ahead of myself. So 500 times 10 to the 18th joules. Now what's that? That's humanities energy budget for the year. Okay, and that's going to become important very soon as soon as we are introduced to Uncle Helios. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's just here's a graph showing that our energy consumption was relatively modest back here in 1820. I also want you to write this number down. 1860 is a number that we're going to use very soon when we're introduced to Uncle Helios. And what we see um, is energy consumption constantly grows. And, and there's, the, there's that magic 500 that I just mentioned. And we can see different technologies coming online. Somebody already mentioned wood burning stoves. There's your, there's your biofuels. Uh, coal came online around 1860 that I just mentioned. Oil was also discovered around 1860 and went up substantially. You can see natural gas. You can see hydroelectric and then finally nuclear, but there we are at 500 exajoules. Okay, one more graph, and I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but we can, we can see that different countries use energy at different rates, and uh, different countries also release CO2 at different rates. So a lot of times our prosperity, and I think we'll talk about this with Bob a little next week, our prosperity is based on how good we are at actually using energy, right? So if we're able to travel more, communicate more, that typically makes societies more robust and more successful. And maybe we'll talk about Iceland a little bit. Iceland is very unique, and almost all of their energy comes from hydroelectric, so yeah. very little CO2 So there. let's just take a look at this graph really sure. quickly. So yeah. if, I am, if I am below the line, like mm -hmm. Iceland, what does that tell me in general about this graph? Oh, sure, sure. So the so what we can see is we move as we move up, it means that you're releasing more carbon dioxide. So typically burning more fossil fuels per person. Um, so you can see up here, Qatar is using a lot of probably a lot of oil. There's a lot of oil there, so they're using it primarily. But as I mentioned, if you're below the line, Iceland, way over here, is is still able to use a lot of energy, so they're very far to, what side is that? The right, so they're still using a lot of energy. They need to keep warm in Iceland, <laughs> but they're not releasing much CO2 because they're getting almost all of their electricity from hydroelectric. So there's different ways to make energy. And that's, that's the point, great, great question. Thanks, Allison. All right, here comes Uncle Helios. Finally, finally we get to be introduced to Uncle Helios. Lady. Woo, here he is. Okay, so here's the problem. And here's where um, I think we're all, we're all fully awake now, and, and I'm going to rely on you to help me with a little bit of math. And I'll, I'll also tell you this, this problem. On the one hand, it's, it's, it's difficult, but on the other hand, once you see the solution, it's very simple. Okay, so here's the problem statement. You're going to put $1 in the bank... Uh, from the moment you're born. And you're actually getting this money from your rich Uncle Helios. One dollar a minute. In hopes of having a, a retirement someday, right? So you, you put money away so you can then retire with the money later. Now, um, that's, that's your, your banking income. 
Now what we're going to do is look at your energy income. Well, not your energy income, but the energy income of all of us, the energy income of the, the whole world. And so most of that comes from the sun, as we talked about last week, from photons. And I just use the word Googles because it's a big number. It's, it's 10 to the 100th. So put Googles of, of photons into the biosphere, into the plants, into the photosynthetic animals that we talked about last time. Every second from the day the Earth is born. Forgot this is going to be on Earth Day, but there you go. So, <laughs> so, we're, so we're, putting, uh, we're putting this energy into the biosphere from the very first day that life emerged on Earth and started getting its energy from the sun. Now, in hopes of enjoying technology, which we're enjoying right now. We're, we're well, working with. We had a few technical <laughs> details, but when technology works, it's great. So, okay. Now, so the question is, when do you get to retire? Okay, so the, so the things I need you to first work out, I'm going to give you a little bit of time on your own, and I email these questions to your teachers, but the, ver the first thing you want to answer is how many minutes old you are when you're 100 years old. So how many minutes old is a 100-year-old person? That's question one. How many minutes old is a 100-year-old person? Okay, you got that? Okay. And I'll let, I'll let you work on that. And I'm going to give you two more questions. Let him work on this for a second. Okay, good, good. Um, so one of the things that we like to do is when you're finished working on this, if you just give me a thumbs up, we'll kind of be able to judge where everybody's at. Right. Thumbs up. You guys look like you're just finishing up. You guys good? Good. 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 How about you, more? You know, they're minute. Are you guys finish just finishing up? Okay. All right. Brad's gonna change over to his calculator. He's gonna get to the calculator here. So who? So what? What? Uh, what answer did you come up with, Cutbank? How many minutes old is a 100-year-old person? Fifty-two million five hundred ninety-six thousand. Fifty-two million. Okay. Uh, more? Did you come up with something similar, or what did you come up with? Yeah. Five hundred sixty thousand. Five hundred sixty thousand. Okay. So, so let's just double check. Hundred. Thousand minutes. Okay, close. And here's what you're going to do anytime you're working on a big technological problem. You're always going to collaborate and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Let's let's do that now. And I'm just going to I'm going to multiply uh, 60 minutes times 24 hours times 365 equals 525. What did I do wrong there? So I, I think I need to get closer to, to um, 50 million. Oh, Cutbank has an answer for you. What did I do wrong? Uh, well, you have to multiply by 100, and the 365 is 365.25. Because of okay. leap years. What, why do I need to multiply by 100? Because it's 100 years. Oh, thanks. There we go. There we go. That was just so that's <laughs> one year. So that's, thank you. So that's the number of minutes in one year. Okay, fantastic. 
Sometimes Uncle Helios <laughs> needs some help too. So. Remember, and multiply it, they said, by a point two five because that includes leap years. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great that you guys got that technical. <laughs> Times 100. So, uh, 52 million, 560. And you're right, it's going to be a little bit longer because that's uh, longer or shorter? 360. Oh, well, I would have to subtract a little bit because the, the year is not quite 365 days long. So, here's what we're going to do as engineers, though. We're going to say that's 50 million. So, everyone can agree that. 52 million is close to 50 million. Okay, so a 100 year old person is 52 million minutes old. Okay, now here's your next question. Your next question is how many years ago did photosynthesis start? How, when was the Earth essentially born in terms of energy coming into the biosphere? <laughs> And again, this is going to be, I mean, nobody knows exactly, but what I'd like us to do is come up with an estimate. I wonder if we should maybe just talk about that one and have some ideas okay. thrown out. Okay, sure. So any, anybody have just a, an, an estimate or an idea on how long ago uh, photons started going into the biosphere and, and photosynthesis started? About 3.5 billion years ago. 3.5 billion? Is that something you, you, you read somewhere or um, figured out on your own? Or where? Yahoo Answers. <laughs> Yahoo Answers. Yahoo Answers. Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else have another number? So I heard 3.5 billion years. Three billion. Three billion. Okay. So again, Nobody knows exactly, but those are both pretty good estimates based on a lot of different studies. So we'll go with we'll go with three billion years. Okay. Now the next question is who remembers when the use of fossil fuels began? And I, I think I mentioned this. 1860. Um, 1860. How many years ago was ago was that? Hundred and fifty or so. Right. Pretty pretty simple answer. Okay. So now the next the next thing I want to introduce you to is the concept of, of energy consumption and, and the peak of these energies. So I don't know if you've heard of peak oil or peak natural gas or peak coal, but it appears that right now we've used up about half of all those resources. So we're we're at the top of this curve, and I'll show you the curve uh, very shortly. And so we're now sort of riding down the back side of this fossil fuel curve. Bob and I are going to talk about this in a lot of detail and what that means for us technologically as well as, as financially. So here's the big question. When do you get to retire? So, well, the next question is if we're halfway through that energy use and it started 150 years ago, how many years do we have left? Well, 300, if we're, if we're about halfway through, and I'll, I'll show you why momentarily. So now what we need to do is turn that energy problem into the financial problem. So when you're, when you're 100 years old, you've got that $50, $50 million saved up, a whole lot of money. The question is, um, when do you get to start using it? So let's, let's take a look at that. Okay, so here's, here's the, the curve that we need to understand. So on the one hand, this point right here is 1860, and over here we're looking at 1860, what's 1860 plus 300? The year 2160 or so. That's, a, that's about when all of our uh, oil, coal, gas, etc. will finally expire, so about 150 years into the future. Now. Let's look at the same curve and not think about the fossil fuel energy, but now let's think of it in terms of the money, the photons that Uncle Helios has given you. How long is this period in your 100 year lifetime? That's the question. I need to figure out how many 
days, minutes, years, this, this curve is in the 100-year-old person's lifetime. So remember, you had 3 billion years of energy accumulation. We're going we're gonna to spend that 3 billion years in 300 years. You had $50 million that were accumulating every minute. How long is this time period in, in Uncle Helios's bank account? That's the question. That's the, that's, that's the question. So it's difficult on one hand, but I think when you see the math, it'll be very simple. So let me so pencil that out for a little bit. If you need to ask, ask a question, let me know. But how long is your retirement period at a dollar a minute? 5,000, yeah, 5,000 years. 5,000 years. Well, it's going to have to be something that's less than the 100-year-old person. So remember, you've got, you only have a 100-year lifespan, so it's going to have to be less than 100 years. But I'm, I'm glad you're that quick on the ball. And we, can, and we can see why you might have arrived at that answer. So, Cuppy. 52, sure. one half minute, minutes. Would be Cut big cable with 52 minutes. So about an hour? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll write that down. <laughs> Allison's writing that down. I'm writing that down. 52 minutes. Explained it well because I can tell there's not too many questions. So I, I, I hope I, I hope I, I hope I explained it well. And if you do have questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, if, if anyone's confused by the by the question, just just raise your hand and, and fire away. Like I said, it's not that easy of a thing to think about. More, do you have, have another another thought? I got five point two six. Oh, a little louder, please. I got five point two six minutes. Five. Five point two six. People sharing answers. This is good. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to think about. Should we give more, right. more a little more time? Or? Why don't we go through the problem? With okay. Them? Okay. Great. So um, I heard I heard two answers. Now I'm I'm really impressed with the speed and accuracy of your answers. A lot of times I'll give these I'll give the same question to my college freshmen and they they uh, they sometimes don't come up with an answer. But a lot of times I'll get guesses. I'll say, oh, when I'm 70 years old, or gosh, maybe when I'm 90 years old, I'll, I'll get to retire and start spending Uncle Helios's money. But uh, Let's, let's take, it the, take a look at the solution and, and see what we come up with. Okay, so what I... Is what that I, Uncle Helios? There's Uncle Helios. <laughs> well, he's actually the Monopoly guy. <laughs> he's a lot like the Monopoly guy. <laughs> but when I, when I went in and you know, looked for uh, just a good image of a rich uncle, the Monopoly guy came up. <laughs> um, this, this picture down here is a, a statue of the Greek god Helios, who was proposed, is supposedly the, the god of the sun. And what, I, what I've tried to do here is, is just build two little two little teeter totters. So you'll see on the right or the left. On, on the, this side. 
<laughs> Go on this side, that side. On this side. On the, un on the Uncle Helio side, the, the long side, uh, is that long time span where photons are accumulating in the biosphere, where your money is going into the bank. And on the short side is the withdrawal. So when we're pulling energy resources out of the earth and when you're pulling those dollars out of the bank account that Uncle Helios is putting for you. So what I'm trying to show here is that really all you're doing is, is setting up these same two ratios. The two lines are exactly the same. So let's, let's throw the numbers in there, literally. So there's your five, uh, 50 million minutes. And I think I might have already given the answer away. But anyway, uh, there's a littler number sitting on the right side. I won't say what it is. <laughs> now, uh, down here with, with the actual photon problem, you have your three billion years. And what you can see on the other side is the 300. So really all we're doing here is setting up a ratio. So you've got the, your 3 billion is the time of deposition of all the carbon in the Earth's biosphere and now in the crust. And then 300 years is the rate, is how much time we will extract it all if we continue on our business as usual course. Now, as you can see, that's a 10 million to 1 ratio. And I think um, somebody actually nailed it there at Cutbank and said, well, if I divide 50 million by 10 million, I get five. Five minutes. So that's, that's where we are. We're, and, and right now, we're halfway through. And let me just show. We're sort of halfway through this five-minute party, if you will, retirement party, using mostly carbon to power our technologies. So that's that's the big the big picture, the big point here that I wanted to show you with Uncle Helios. Okay, some people might say, gosh, this is really uh, crazy, this is a little depressing. Some other people might say, gosh, this is a fantastic opportunity. We're right here at this at this at this peak of human civilization and we can now make decisions moving forward. So I want to show you just a little bit more of the math. Um, same same idea here. This this probably looks a little bit like some of the scribbles you guys just did, but uh, this is this is how it looked to me. A dollar a minute, a hundred years old. There's your fifty million minutes. There's your three billion years. That's three times ten to the ninth, uh, etc. And then just showing you the the math. It just turns into a fraction problem. One equation, one unknown. I think you can see that 300 divided by 3 billion is the same as 5 divided by 50 million. So that's, that's the solution. And then again, just showing this, this, uh, this curve with 1850 or 1860 here, and then um, about 300 years in the future. So let's just review this. So sure. you're, saying, yeah. you're saying that we have, for the last 3 billion years, Yes. We've been saving all this energy, essentially, right. in the sun. We've been putting it in the bank. Right. And so we get about, we get, we start using it. Come 1860, we right. start taking that out. That's right. And if we, we, if we sort of look at that in um, the lifespan of a human, mm. that equates to the total time we get to take it out is five minutes. Right. And we've already used up. 2.5 minutes. That's right. We're right at, we're right at this top of right the peak. Right at the top yep. of the peak. That mm -hmm. means that we only have about the same amount left of fossil fuels or energy that was stored in the ground right. in our bank. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody in Moore or Cut Bank have any questions about that? Or thoughts or comments? Kind of a staggering is, thing is, to think about. It is a staggering thing to think about. It's, it's uh, you know, on the one hand, it's like wow, that it's a it's a pretty pretty special place in, in uh, time where we are technologically, energy, but, and we're living it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everyone everyone feels confident on that. They understand where that's coming from. Yeah. Thumbs up if that feels under. We understand that. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. It, it makes my head spin a little bit too every time I talk about it. Okay, but that's 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 where we are. So, um, again, and these, and, and I don't expect you to, to memorize these numbers. What I'm what I'm hoping this does is inspire you to think about where you are um, in your own life. I know you've, you've you've talked about your own energy consumption. Uh, this is where the rest of the world is, uh, really, in terms of their 
uh, energy consumption. Right smack dab in the middle is the world average. And you can see this is energy consumption per person per day. And I think we were already doing some of that. At the, at the bottom, we're looking at... The bottom got cut off on me a little bit. Where's Iceland on this chart? Oh, good question. Not on this chart. Oh, no, no, no I, I think I see them right, no. right, right at the top. Okay. So Iceland consumes a lot of energy per person per day. And the, the lines here are the energy densities. And then the, the number at the bottom Move that up a little bit. Yeah, let me, um, guys, let me just es escape out of that really quick and, and pull that number at the bottom. Oh, that's the population density. So at the very bottom, that's, that's how densely populated the, the, the place is. So you can see Ireland has a very low population density, Canada as well, Bahrain, Bangladesh, they have much greater population density. So if you think back to that, uh, that big solar panel kind of covering the ground, uh, you probably would not, oh thanks Alice, you probably would not want to be covering your very small country with that much solar. So then we get back to that question is where's the best place to put these energy technologies? Okay, so that wraps up the main part of the lecture. I hope everyone's head is, is now spinning with the, <laughs> with the Uncle Helios problem. A couple more things I want to uh, throw out to you before I say goodbye for this week is uh, we do have one really special class coming up. I think I might have mentioned this, but just in case other people have only heard this one lecture. We have a really special class coming up June 15th to June 16th. That's here in Missoula. And we're going to offer it both to high school teachers and to high school students. The really neat thing about the high school students is it's $49.50 a credit. So you can come down to Missoula, take this course for $49.50 a credit. It's a two-credit course, so for less than $100 you get the credits. There's also a course fee of uh, $160. So for $260, you come down and get two college credits towards your college degree. Uh, we've built all kinds of crazy contraptions in the past. You can see right here is the 2012 solar car. You can see a student building a wind turbine. Here on this side, this was an example of a wind turbine. We have all kinds of other videos out there. And I encourage you just to go out and Google Missoula College Energy Technology. We've got a, really, a, a lot of really neat YouTube videos of some of the projects that we've done in the past. One thing we're even going to do right here at the Hive is help them build a Tron wall, help them actually build a solar technology right, right here in Missoula. So if you're interested, uh, I'm pretty easy to find. You can send me, send me an email or give me a phone call. You can also connect with me, and I can get all of the information to Brad. Right. right. Yes, sir, cut bank. Uh, when is that, or like how many days? Oh, sure. And the, the dates are here. Let me, uh, so again, uh, June 15th, so we're going to start on Monday, June 15th, and we're going to go through Friday, June 26th. And you can, you can stay in the dorms here in Missoula. Uh, a lot of times, if you've got friends or family, we can, we can find folks for you to stay with. But uh, it, and it's a great and opportunity to interact with college students. Yes? And like the credits would be transferable to anywhere, like in-state, or would they have to be from Missoula? Well, any, anywhere in state, they're certainly transferable to, and that's a question I get a lot of times too, is, and every college is different. So <laughs> I'm not, not every college or university in the country or the world for that matter accepts credits from every other college or university in, in the world or country for that matter. Uh, a lot of times I'll have students come in and I don't have a problem accepting, accepting credits, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Generally, and it's a petition that you go through with the college. So if you are thinking about going out of state to another college, um, it's just a, they have a petition form, and then they connect with the university system here and kind of get the lowdown on it. And so that's, right. that was my experience in right. the past doing right. that. Right, and our, our, um, our college, our, my department is actually called Applied Computing and Engineering Technology. So uh, if you're thinking about going to engineering school down the road, you could get some engineering credits for this as well. Uh, 
So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure thing. All right, I just, I yeah. just want to, a couple a couple more things. One, I want to thank the World Affairs Council and the Dennis Phyllis Washington Foundation as well as Dr. Layton. Thank you. Next week when we have the panel, I want everybody to come with questions. We're going to have, like I said, three panelists. Um, they're each going to give a very, very short talk. Um, but what I'm really excited about is the time to talk about all the things we've been discussing the last three lectures. And we have three experts for you to shoot these questions out to. So. Um, your homework this week is to come with those questions, come with Perfect. those those big ideas that might be percolating in your mind right now. Perfect. Okay. All Thanks. right, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks nice so much, you. and we'll see yeah. you next week. Have a wonderful week.